Nate Aberea here with you on World Soccer Talk Radio. You know, my favorite part about this job, without a doubt, is the people that I get to interact with, the guests that I get to interview, the just amazing individuals around the soccer world that I have the privilege of talking to. We've never had a bad guest on this show. We've had some really, really, really good ones as well. Today, folks might take the cake as far as the name that we're bringing in. We've got a legend for you today. Martin Tyler. That's right. The Martin Tyler. One of the all-time greats in the craft of soccer commentary. Martin Tyler will be with us on World Soccer Talk Radio. Taking a trip down memory lane. A glorious trip down memory lane. We will relive some of Martin's greatest all-time calls, and we'll get on the gantry with Martin Tyler. We'll get a taste, get a feel for what goes on up there, what he does before and during a Premier League match or an England match, whatever match he may be calling. Get a taste for his preparation, maybe some of his rituals, how he gets ready for these commentary assignments you're listening to Sports Byline. Thanks for subscribing to us on iTunes, TuneIn, and Stitcher as well. Checking out the website, worldsoccertalk.com. Twitter in the crazy thing known as the Twitter sphere. At Sports Byline USA for updates on the program. At World Soccer Talk. That's the one you got to write down. At World Soccer Talk for all of your soccer inclined Twitter gold that you've got ready to throw out for the world's enjoyment and get at me at Nate WST with the love mail and the hate mail again at Nate WST. A huge thank you to all of you who've already gotten involved, sending some suggested questions for this interview and getting ready for one of what I'm hoping to be one of our finest shows that we have ever had. Martin Tyler is with us on the other side of this break right here on World Soccer Talk Radio. You don't go anywhere we're back after this welcome back into world soccer talk radio here on the sports byline broadcasting network my name is nate abarea and it is a great privilege to welcome in martin tyler to the show martin how you doing sir thank you so much for coming on my pleasure, Nate. And if um, if our paths have crossed, I I couldn't believe that you would have listened to my work as a five year old. But um, uh, I'm not feeling quite as old as probably I should do because of that uh, information that you've just given me. Um, but it's uh, a pleasure to talk about the game that we we both love and hopefully uh, all the listeners love as well. Well, we will definitely uh, get to that experience for yours truly uh, as as a five-year-old in Northern California a little bit later in the show, that famous night at Anfield uh, that was back in 1996. And, you know, you, you've been doing this for, for such a long time, and, and you're an absolute legend of the craft. And one of the things that, that I want to know is, you know, when another Premier League season comes along, what what makes each one unique, and specifically in regards to, to this one, the 2015-2016 campaign. What's getting you buzzing uh, about this Premier League season? Well, I think the fact that uh, you're know, doing a, a live broadcast gets you buzzing whatever time in the season, the, the beginning, the middle, or the end. Um, it's the next broadcast that I always look forward to. That's what always motivates me. And um, It just so happens we're at the, the beginning of the campaign. And I, I suppose you're right in a way, Nate, that... Um, I did go through a little bit of a sort of psychological test of my own to make sure that I feel excited as always for the start of a new campaign. You know, you do need a, a couple of weeks off at the end. It's a long season. We do a lot of traveling. Um, but once I'm into that couple of weeks, I'm, I'm beginning to get the buzz pretty soon. And uh, I, I certainly have had it again for the start of this season. Um, I think I'm very lucky still to be doing the job, really. You know, I've, I've had a, a long career and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, and I want to keep doing it, but it's other people who decide whether I, I do it or not. Um, and at the moment, they're still pushing me in the direction of matches. So uh, 
uh, I must be ready. Uh, you can, I believe you can build a reputation in 40 years and lose it in 40 seconds. So I've just about done the first bit. I must make sure I don't do the second <laughs> bit. Uh, now, Martin, every every commentator has a different way of preparing for a match. Mm. Can, can you give us a feel of, of what your preparations are like for a commentary assignment? Well, I can't really compare them to anybody else's, but what I do is I think what I might feel are the statutory checks for the teams, the players, the fixture. For example, I'm doing um, for Sky Sports in here in the UK, I'm, I'm doing the game between Manchester City and Chelsea on Sunday. So you know what they've done at the start of the season. I was actually, uh, I saw Chelsea in the Community Shield. Uh, I saw Manchester City on Monday at West Bromwich Amherst. So I've actually seen both clubs play, which is always the case when you, you get an early season fixture. Um, and then I'm looking at the components. I'm, I'm looking at um, the history of the fixture. Uh, obviously what it means at uh, this stage, what it might mean if City win, um, which would put them obviously five points clear at Chelsea after two games, which would be an extraordinary scenario, but not an impossible one. Um, Chelsea win, of course, they go back above Manchester City, and uh, I know we're talking only two games of the campaign, but uh, you know it's, it's what the headlines will be, um, not just in this country, but around the world. So to put it into context, really, um, but what I really love is I suppose playing manager in my mind, you know, working out maybe what, um, how they're going to line up, what issues have happened, how has Mourinho managed to, um, well, he he drew there last year and they really should have won because they were playing against 10 men and of course they allowed Frank Lampard, of all people, (laughs) playing for Manchester City to score against Chelsea. The year before, the season before, um, we called it a, a Mourinho Monday night masterclass because they won one nil at Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea won one nil at Manchester City with a, uh, a a marvelous tactical display. So I've sort of been trying to recall that. In fact, although Chelsea won that game, Manchester City went on to win the league, as you all know. So it was uh, a little bit of a hollow victory in the end, but it was a victory, and that's what Chelsea be looking looking to do, having had a fairly ordinary. I know you've had them uh, in North America playing in the preseason, um, but it's a fairly short preseason. Uh, they didn't play well in the Community Shield. They then had a friendly at home to Fiorentina, which they lost. And then, of course, they were twice in the lead against um, Swansea and, and only got a draw and had their goalkeeper sent off. So it's not all been sweetness of light. And I don't know whether the story about the medical department has reached you, but. Um, uh, Jose Mourinho has made more headlines by falling out with the club doctor and the first team physio. So, for all those issues to take into account, that's all part of the preparation to go back to your original question. So, you've got to get the journalistic lines in your head as well as and, and, and establish the truth of them, of course. Uh, so, there's a lot of work, and people always ask me how long I, I take to prepare, but the simple answer is. How long have I got between that? Um, but I do the game on Monday, and we're now talking about Sunday for the next game, so I've had five days, really. And um, I will go down to Jose Mourinho's press conference tomorrow, um, which happily for me is about a mile and a half from where I live, which is... Um, <laughs> I've spent many of my 40 years traveling up and down the country to press conferences in the most inconvenient times and places. <laughs> but since Chelsea got this training ground um, in uh, Cobham in Surrey uh, uh, some seven or eight years ago, it's been on my doorstep. I was here first. They moved to me. I didn't move to them. <laughs> so um, I, That makes it a little bit easier because I, I'll have more time doing other things um, in terms of prep to, before I go down and, and see what Jose's got to say. I'm, I'm sure it'll be nice to get in there early because it'll be um, it'll be a sold-out sign at the match, but also at Jose's press conference as well. Well, surely Chelsea uh, had you in mind uh, when when they moved uh, to your to your neck of the woods, Martin. We've got a wow. <laughs> we've got about two minutes left uh, before we got to head to a break here. And one thing I'm curious about is. Do you have any sort of, uh, we've talked about this with other broadcasters on the show, do you have any sort of rituals uh, that you go through before your, your commentary assignments? I mean, whether it's going on a walk or, or eating the same meal, uh, has there been anything over the years that has become a, a sort of ritual uh, before a, a commentary assignment? No, I, I like to get to the ground very early. I think that's probably the, 
obsession that I have because I, you know, the one thing you, you, you can be forgiven a, a mistake or two. Certainly, if there's not too many of them, you get forgiven. Um, but I think not getting there is <laughs> is something that will be hard to forgive. Really, of course, there are other risks of, of, of travel difficulties, and I've got a few stories of co- other commentators who've had um, terrible journeys. And, and I think Arlo White, of course, is now doing a great job for NBC. I think he he got late to a game um, travelling in the UK last season because of a real, you know, a train broke down or something like that, and he was just absolutely <laughs> isolated. That can happen. Um, so, no, it's just, it's, I'm more, I'm, once I'm there, I'm relaxed. And, but you get the same build-up as, you know, I tried to be a player, first of all. I mean, that, and, then, and I, I sort of equate my, my build-up to that. Yeah, I do like to eat the right things. I'm not always able to do that. And in the UK, some of the food, when you're traveling around and the and the, the fast food outlets, not the best stuff to be eating, but <laughs> needs much, you know. Um, uh, but I like to, you know, get plenty of sleep before a game and and make sure that uh, I'm there in comfortable time. But and the nice build up, and you know, you get that sort of excitement. And I was saying to Kevin Kilban, who I work with um, on the Monday night game at, um, at West Brom's uh Monday night game our time. Uh, about 20 minutes for kickoff. So this is a wonderful time. You see the players warming up. You feel the excitement that they're feeling, that the crowd are feeling. And I think you've got to get that also as part of your if you like, your durability in, in the profession to be able to still get that. And it's like almost naive excitement, childlike excitement that oh yeah, what's going to happen here? And you know you've done all your work on the teams, and and now you see what actually happens. You know what the tactical battles are, and and how the game pans out, and whose name you're going to be shouting, um, you know, uh, louder than, than somebody else's that particular night. So it's, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, the, the bottom line, and I know you've got to go to a break, the bottom line is that um, uh, you can't do a perfect commentary. It's impossible. There are too many variables, but you can always try to do one, and that's what keeps you on your toes, really. Martin Tyler is with us here on World Soccer Talk Radio. We are taking a glorious trip down memory lane on the other side of this break. We're heading to Anfield. We're heading to Highbury. We're heading to Wembley. We're heading to Munich. We're going all over the place. Stay with us. We're back after this on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Nate Abarea and Martin Tyler back here with you on World Soccer Talk Radio. During the break, we were we were reliving my my drive home with my father back in 1996 from that FA Cup final experience. The the, the Gooner supporting dad saying it's going to be okay. Come on, chin up, lad. Me just looking back, crying, going, "You don't understand. You can't relate to this. Come on." All right, we're going England now. We're going English national team. And this one for me, Martin, as, as we continue this, this nostalgic trip down, down memory lane of, of your commentary work, we go to Munich. It's 2001. It's a, a game that has had songs written about it. It's England 5, Germany 1, an almost unbelievable scoreline. And, and there's one moment in particular that stands out for me in, in reviewing your commentary alongside Andy Gray from that match, and it's, it's the fifth goal. It's the Emil Heskey goal that was, that was the <laughs> fifth, and, and you just yelling out almost in disbelief, it's uh... 5! It's 5! I mean, re- can, you, can you kind of relive that moment when the fifth goal went in? Well, some of my colleagues have been reliving it for years because they shout Heskey at me in that kind of tone. Uh, if I, you know, if, if they want to wind not wind me up, but tease me about, you know, being getting overexcited, maybe. Um, it's there are things that you can't explain about commentating, mate, which is the level that you get taken to when the truly exceptional moment happens, and you can't plan it. You can't get there unless it's exceptional. It's not an act. It's what you really feel. Um, and maybe sometimes that that is a bit of a worry because you, you just don't know when the next time comes along whether you're going to get there. It's just not It's not something that you can rehearse. And that was one of those moments. Um, and I think there was also probably 
maybe not quite in that sentence, but uh, around the whole broadcast, there's a certain amount of relief that England were doing well because it's the worst commentary. And they've, they've knocked the stadium down now. They don't use it for football anymore. Thank goodness. It's, I, people ask me about the best things all the time. Let me tell you about the worst stadium to commentate from, the <laughs> Olympic Stadium in Munich. You're near a Stuttgart than you are the pitch. And uh, it, it, it's horrendous. And you go into games like that going, please, may I survive this? Please, may I survive it? So um, that was uh, obviously an exceptional evening and uh, a great, a, a great I, it was a bit, well, it was it was bittersweet for me if I, if you want a personal recollection. I mean, there, there was a, a great commentator over here who um, who had helped me a lot and I'd worked with in my early days at ITV called Brian Moore. And um, when I got back to the dressing room with all the jubilation going around the England camp, and then back there, somebody came out of the dressing room and told me that Brian had died. And that I heard that on the track at Munich. Um, and I lost a, a, a wonderful broadcaster, a good friend, and uh, somebody who had been a mentor to me. So it was a mixed, a mixed day, really, personally. Wow, well, that's an incredibly touching story and uh, it's we, we we talk about the the duality of of football and i mean is, is that really does that kind of stand out for you as one of the ultimate like you know moments of of duality within within footballing life for you that day in munich yeah i guess so um you know i haven't had such wood so many you know moments as extreme as that you know the, the game could have been 2-2 two, two and brian could have been taken ill rather than died, you know. But it was an extreme occurrence that England went to a Germany in one five one. But it was, um, as I say, for me, it's always associated that particular day with the loss of, of someone that um, I had huge admir- admiration for. Well, Martin, I really appreciate you sharing uh, such a such a personal story here with us. And uh, hey, let's kind of let's relive a little bit more of of that two thousand one time with England. It, it was such a bizarre period. For the English national team, and, and there was the danger of, of missing out on the World Cup, and it, it was the, the Sven Jorn Eriksson Rescue Act, and so let's go to really the, the, the penultimate as far as the rescue uh, goes, and that was the, the match versus Greece uh, back at, at Old Trafford, 2-2. The, the the moment that really cemented David Beckham as as an icon uh, for for years to come for I mean infinite years uh, to come. What do you remember about that final moment uh, from David Beckham, that free kick to rescue a draw against Greece to really sneak in uh, to the World Cup in 02? Well, I remember a lot about it. Um, I can uh, I got the feeling that. He'd taken several other free kicks uh, in the course of England desperately needed a goal, otherwise so they did not qualify them. Um, he got nearer and nearer. And so I really felt that the shot would be on target. Obviously, I didn't know that he would score. Um, but I was able to, to set it up um, uh, in a way that uh, uh, reflected how I felt at the time. You know, you know, as I said before, these things are not acted. They're just words to respond to the feelings of the commentator. Um, he, and, and of course, I've been very lucky enough to discuss it a few times with David since. <laughs> uh, and uh, he uh, he delivered. And as you say, he, he was building a reputation then. But of course, in 1998, he'd been sent off in the World Cup playing for England against Argentina at a crucial stage on a night that he went out. And one wondered then whether he'd ever be able to win the hearts and minds of the English public back again. Well, he certainly did um, good and proper uh, on that uh, uh, that particular strike of the ball. Greece played really well. Yes. <laughs> I can remember that too. And uh, probably deserved not to, uh, uh, probably deserved to win the game. But uh, England dug it out. And uh, yeah, they haven't been in my career. They're, the words that I've always wanted to say um, and, and I've never had the chance in my broadcasting career, even though it's been going on for, for years and years, years, I've never said England has won the World Cup. And, uh, you know, whether I will still get the chance to do that, um, you know, I'm running out of options. So that's sort of like that. But you never know. You never know. Um, uh, but so that was that was almost like a World Cup winning moment. It was, it was very, very special, and, uh, of course. And let me just say, Nate, these moments, these moments are for the players. You know, I'm, I, I probably describe myself as maybe a witness 
to these great, a, a witness with the power of uh, communication. But they are that's David Beckham's moment. We've talked about Dan Collymore's moment and Emil Heskey's moment. And, uh, they are. It, it's it's the fortune to be there. We don't pick our games, you know. Certainly not in my company. Anyway, we get sent and we get an email because uh, these days. It used to be the phone call, but now it's the email, and uh, you go to the games. And obviously, there are lots of things that have happened in football in my 40 years that I haven't been at. But um, I've been lucky enough to have my fair share of um, a very special one. You out there, if you're an aspiring broadcaster or you're a current broadcaster, whether it's soccer, whether it's American football, baseball, whatever your your commentary assignment is, please, please write this quote down or plant it on your brain. You are a witness with the power of communication. Please, please, if there's one thing that you can take away from this interview here with Martin Tyler, please write that down and remember that for all of your broadcasts in the future. And I most definitely definitely will we've got six minutes left here with you martin so i want to reel off as many of these uh, as as possible and it's funny we'll actually stay at old trafford i watched this one the other day it was september of 03 it was in my opinion the greatest nil nil draw in in the history of of modern english football it was the battle of old trafford it was the beginning of arsenal's undefeated invincibles premier league season and there are, there's no game for me that's a, a non-Liverpool game, a game that doesn't include my beloved club, where I can watch it to this day, and when a moment happens, and I've seen it a hundred times, I still jump out of my seat, pumping my fist, and that's how I feel every time Ruud van Nistelrooy's penalty just clatters the crossbar, and there's so much drama, there's so much going on. What, what do you remember about the chaos of the Battle of Old Trafford in 2003? Well, the rivalry was at its keenest then, and obviously after Manchester United were the top two, they were going for everything pretty much together, certainly domestically. And it wasn't a very pleasant affair most times than when they met, but um, this one, when you think, I think it was game seven of the 38 game season. Um, and of course, if Nathan Nistelrooy's penalty is a couple of millimeters lower, there's no invincibles. So. Uh, it's sort of forgotten. I, I, I do credit you, Nate, for, for bringing this into it. When you start to say, I, I, I don't think, well, what happened in September 2003? I, <laughs> I can't really remember. But I give you uh, great credit for it. And it, it, it is a significant uh, moment because the invincible season is probably one of the greatest things that's happened for a club in, in, in modern football in, in, in this country. And, and it wouldn't have happened. But but for that penalty failure. And Van Nistelrooy didn't miss very often. So uh, he, even he was probably caught up in the, in the um, turbulent atmosphere of the day. Move on, because we're running out of time. A <laughs> couple of millimeters <laughs> lower, and there's no invincibles. Exactly. All right, hey, hey, we're, we're going to go back to a couple of Liverpool ones real quick. December of 04, Anfield. It's known by Liverpool fans simply as the night of Olympiacos. It's Gerard. It's when it's when Andy just yelled into the microphone. <laughs> oh yeah, beauty. Andy took over. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what was that like when Andy suddenly became became the play-by-play broadcaster for a moment? Uh, it was great. I mean, I, I always said to him, "Thank goodness you let me say Gerard," <laughs> and uh, that's all I said. I think uh, the, the rest was Andy, and uh, you know, we, we 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 were a great team, and we enjoyed each other's company. We enjoyed working with each other. We balanced up completely the wrong way round. The play-by-play guy is supposed to get really, really excited <laughs> and the analyst is supposed to be super cool and calm. And I think we got it the other way around. So I don't know quite how that happened, but it was our natural temperaments. And, you know, I still, I, he's working now in in, um, in Doha and he's making a great success of that as well. And I talked to him from time to time and we're still good mates. But, you know, that was... Um, yeah, that was a great night, and and Andy, it's Andy's night, and just even Gerard's night, <laughs> followed by Andy. I, I played a small role in the uh, in that particular movie. <laughs> Oh, well, with one swing of his gifted right foot, Steven Gerrard says, Champions League knockout stage, here we come. All right, there's one other Stevie G moment I got to ask you about, and that is May of 06 at Cardiff. We're going to Wales for this one. It was the last Cardiff FA Cup final. Liverpool 3, West Ham 3. Liverpool win it on penalties. But an equalizer in stoppage time from Steven Gerrard. And again, it was one of those moments where you seem truly blown away. You just said the word stunning. And, and then it was almost as if you were just in awe 
of, of what you were witnessing. What do you remember about that moment in Cardiff back in 06? Well, just a, how West Ham managed not to win that game from the position where they, I think they had a throw in down by the corner flag and, you know, it was just to get the ball up the field and away and, and keep it away from every Liverpool player, but most of all, keep it away from Stephen Gerrard. And um, he could, only he could have done it. I mean, now um, uh, in, the, in the US, hopefully you'll see why he's so special and he, um, he was a, a one-man tornado of a footballer, you know. He was just, and he just refused to be beaten on, on a number of occasions. Uh, the Olympiacos won the Champions League final in 2005, and this Cup final was um, just just ridiculously heroic, really. And uh, it, it sums up the man that, that you couldn't meet a more modest guy, but on the field, oh, a tiger, and uh, the one who was determined to to get his mouth full of that FA Cup, that's for sure. Hey, we'll, we'll close with this one. We've we got 60 seconds left here down memory lane. The final day of 2012, the famous Sergio Aguero goal for Manchester City. And there, there was something that you said within that commentary moment. And it was, you may never see anything like this ever again. And, and no, that kind of sums I said, up. I, I, sw- I swear you will, you will never see anything like this. And that's the only time I've sworn on the air by saying, <laughs> I swear. And... Uh, uh, hopefully that will continue to the end of my career, <laughs> that unblemished record. Um, but uh, I do stand by that. You will never see anything like it again. The last kick of the 20th Premier League season, everything else finished really, and certainly the other game that Matt had finished. And they scored two in stoppage time, Matthew City, to win the league. And it was uh, uh, um, breathtaking. And um, I would hope one day that I might be able to discuss it with Sergio Aguero. I've, I've never had the chance to do that in the, uh, what are we now, three plus years. But I'm going to Manchester City on Sunday. So, <laughs> uh, And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the other problem it's caused is he scored plenty of other goals since then when I've been commentating. But, you know, you're being judged by how many O's you put on the end of the, uh, uh, the, end of the goal scoring. <laughs> so... so um, I have to make sure I don't go the full O's because I, I swear I'll never broadcast like that ever again. Oh, you, you swore. You swore again. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and if you haven't, if you haven't out there seen the, uh, the new Sky Sports ad uh, preview in the Premier League season with Frank Sinatra's That's Life playing and Thierry Henry taking a walk through uh, 23 years of Premier League football, and it features so much of your commentary. Please, please check that out, the uh, the new Sky Sports ad. Martin Tyler, it has been a great pleasure and a great privilege having you on the show. You're welcome back anytime, and uh, best of luck this weekend uh, at the Etihad, sir. No, thank you for inviting me. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, now I've got to get back to my prep for Sunday. <laughs> All right, cheers to you, Martin.